Hi, I'm Rory, and with me, as always, is Ken. How, how are you doing, Ken? Exceptionally well, Rory. Thank you so much for asking. And Rory and I both hope that you are well. You've joined us for the Counseling Tutor Podcast. You've caught us at episode 246. Three stops on today's journey, starting off with theory and practice, where we take an element of theory and look at how that shows in the day-to-day -day practice of being a counselor or psychotherapist. And today we're going to be looking at Patuska Clarkson's five relationship model. Excuse my pronunciation there, <laughs> tripping over my tongue this morning. Uh, we then move on to practice partner where we recognize that so many of us either full-time have a private practice that we run or part-time we have a private practice we run and we look at uh, different elements of running building starting a private practice and uh, today we're looking at paid advertising how can we generate inquiries by paying for that and what does that look like what are the different uh, avenues available to us and then we move on to practice matters where we look at an element of uh, practice something that may show up in our therapy room that uh, we will see and and today we have an interview with Dr. Dwight Turner. You met up with him, Rory, to speak about working with otherness. Um, it's a really big topic. I like the, the, the wording of that, working with otherness. Uh, so that to come for you. But we're starting off with that three, uh, with that uh, theory in practice and Pachukska Clarkson's five relationship model, Rory. Yes, and, and the reason that I brought this is because um, our Facebook group, and if you're not a member of our Facebook group, go to Facebook, type in Counselling Tutor, um, you'll let you in and you'll see thousands of thousands of like-minded people all really talking about the world of counselling and psychotherapy. There's tutors, there's students, there's qualified practitioners, there's a, a, a soup song of uh, supervisors in there, and it's a really great conversation. So come and join the party pose your questions and, and join this really strong, supportive community. And one of the questions that's, that gets asked time and time again is the is the topic of what's called transpersonal psychotherapy. And the person who, who really coined the phrase and who really wrote the book on transpersonal psychotherapy is a person called Petruska Clarkson. She was from South Africa. She wrote a book called The Therapeutic relationship which stands up her theories stand up in the pantheon of of relational theories alongside carl rogers six necessary and sufficient conditions and her idea is a very 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 simple one there are five elements to forming and sustaining and maintaining a therapeutic relationship and she called this the the five relationship model and they're sometimes called phases. And what she said is if these five things were in place and and used and received by the client, the the relationship would be would be sometimes referred to as low gravity. It's very unlikely to fall over or blow over if there's any kind of emotional winds around. And she starts off by by talking about um the working alliance. Everyone knows that right at the beginning of any therapeutic relationship, you make a contract. And the Working Alliance is about the contract, making sure that both parties fully understand what the contract is, the times that you turn up, the duration of the therapy, how long the therapy is for, I guess in paid work, how much the fee is, when the fee will be paid. So right at the beginning, there is clarity, absolute clarity. And then she goes on to talk about, um, and we don't talk about this very often on the, the, the Counselling Tutor podcast, transference and counter-transference. And I think this is a really important element of a therapeutic relationship because sometimes we are reminded, our clients remind us of relationships from the past, or they may look like someone from the past. And that brings up feelings and thoughts from the past, which we can project onto someone brand new. If I was sitting in front of maybe someone who looked like my old head teacher, it would be wrong of me to think of that person as my old head teacher, who I didn't like very much. <laughs> um, this is someone brand new, nothing like the person in the past. But to be aware of that, to be aware of that transference and the counter transference is, of course, how we react to that, how I'd react to someone who was someone who looked like my old 
you know, my old head teacher or my old teacher. So being thoughtful of that and 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 and, and keeping that in in our mind as we're working with a client, and then quite radically. She talks about the reparative de developmental model. And I know we've talked in the podcast quite often about the good enough other, the fact that the therapist provides a stabilizing, a solid base, sometimes referred to, you know, as, as a, you know, as a, as a solid base um, or a consistent base. So the, the, the client can be themselves and act out in a way that allows them to to grow. And sometimes we meet clients who may may have not been able to act out kind of childish behaviours or have been repressed. And and by being a a solid kind of pseudo parental figure, we allow that in the therapy room, that kind of loving love in the therapy room to be able for the client to be themselves. She moves on to something called a person to person relationship and what i like about this is this is about the this is this is very rogerian it's about congruence it's about reality it's about working as a genuine real person within the relationship and then finally and this is the part i really love about this theory the transpersonal relationship and this is so hard to put into words but um you know recently i i visited ken and Ken and Colette in, in Wales, and we spent some time together. And for me, there was a real solid feeling of connection. It couldn't be something that was tangible or, or draw or write down, but that sense of knowing the other as a human being, of, of the values, of the understanding, of the connectedness. And that is the basis of the model. And the idea is that when we're working in in therapy, we keep those in mind as as different parts because if one of them fails according to the theory, then the relationship may not be as stable. And I know there's a lot of people listening to this, Ken, who probably do person-centered therapy. But I, what I would do is I'd implore you to download the handout that comes with the podcast mm -hmm. and have a look at it because I think it's a good way of looking at relationships in general. And I think it does speak to personal development in a great way, Ken. Absolutely, Rory. And, and you know, this section that we have here, theory to practice. So there's the theory, beautifully outlined. Go and get that handout. Um, and you'll get that by going to counselingtutor.com. Click on the podcast tab right at the top of the page. Make your uh, way to two. 146 that's today's episode and you'll be able to get the theory handout so you'll have the theory in front of you but what we're looking at here is how does this theory show itself within our therapy room and as i was listening to the theory rory and you beautifully describing that i i am mindful that yes that this is a specific theory that we're looking at but it mm -hmm. relates so much to person-centered and other theories as well so we start off with that working alliance so if i look to transactional analysis that's going to be covering a working alliance the contracting so important there if i look to person-centered you're going to be contracting if you're a cbt practitioner you're going to be contract you're going to be outlining outlying what is what is available and what is on offer so we can easily map uh, that domain transferential <laughs> again we look to we look to transactional analysis where we're going to be working with transference and counter transference there and this transferential element is interesting um because often the, the very nature of transference and can counter transference is that it can be invisible mm. and i think it's about personal development rory you know it's it's noticing what's going on within self so you you have a client the client is presenting they're saying something and you're feeling a low level of irritation towards this client you know, and we can easily just like brush that away and oh, let me just focus in on this client. But if we take note of that, that that may be something that is uh, transferential. And it's something that, of course, that we can take into our supervision if we're experiencing that transferential or counter transference within the, the relationship. Um, the reparative development needed relationship. The, the, this is... I really like it. It's that good enough other, as you mm. say, Rory. And so often, you know, a client 
may have gone through life being let down by those closest, those that are supposedly there to support and love them. They can be let down by those people. And then you might see this showing itself in, in, in therapy where they might say something you know, like, you know, nobody's ever listened to me like this before. And that's being that good enough other. There you are seeing that uh, in action within your therapy room. We show up as therapists professionally for the benefit of that client. And that's a rare and precious type of relationship. And sometimes the client may look at that as being a, an element of stability within their life. It can, it can be an example of how people can be um, and can show up. And it, and it may contradict what they feel. You know, all people are just out for themselves. All people don't care about me. But within therapy, we get to be that significant other. I think that's a, a really, a really important factor. And it's almost a parenting or reparenting side um, uh, within it. The person to person relationship I love because this just goes into what the, um, uh, what the research shows us is that no matter what modality of therapy you are practicing, that relationship, that person to person, human to human relationship is what really counts. One human being there in service of the other without judgment, unconditionally being there, listening to this person in a threat-free environment, <clears throat> excuse me, so rare. And of course, probably the most important part of, of, of what we're doing there. And then the transpersonal relationship, Rory, as you said, um, it's, it's a, 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 an interesting one, isn't it? I, it's that's almost spiritual in nature, yes. it's the feeling that you get. And what's interesting here when we speak about this is that towards the end of Carl Rogers's work, he started speaking about that more spiritual element of counseling, something that can't really be explained in words. And if you've been a practicing uh, counselor or psychotherapist for some time, you'll have seen this, you'll have seen it in a client where they almost get a new lease a realization which changes who they are and how they choose to go forward. It is incredibly powerful and very difficult to explain. Very often we can do very little and then still see this happening because it happens from the client side and it is because of the relationship. And I think just using this as a theory, being able to map where we are, no matter what our modality is to this, just gives us a, a, a an, an interesting pegboard, as it were, as it were, Rory, to put the peg in. So where is this client with me? Where were we at in this relationship? Yes, I mean it's a distinct model from from you know the person centered model, but I, I would pick up on the transferential and counter transferential in terms of in practice or the theory to practice. You know, you may get a client who says, "You remind me of," and then whoever that is. And it's really important that if that happens, I've had that happen, you know, with female clients that you, you remind me of someone who was abusive to me in the past because it was male, maybe because I had dark hair or my build or even the inflection in my voice. And it's really important that you rework that transference in the here and now. If that happens, you know, my response to that would be, I, I really hear that you, you, I look on sound or whatever it is that makes you feel the, the feelings that you had of that other person, but I'm not that person. Mm. I'm I am not that person that you that, that you that the, the feelings that you're in have. And that starts off a conversation about not not everybody's the same. And also it 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 pegs in the ground the fact that those feelings are from a past relationship, not from this relationship, although understandable. And in terms of the reparative develop, developmentally needed relationship, that can be as simple as um, normalizing something. How many times can have, have we, in, as, as therapists, listened to clients who said, "Well, I, you know, what, when this happened, I I froze, and I wish I'd have run away, or I wish I'd have put a fight up." And as a therapist, will say, "Well, actually, that you know, freezing is 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 what majority of people do. That's how our that's how our mind reacts when we." using a little bit of trauma-informed information, we say that's quite normal, inverted commas, for yeah. humans to do that. And the relief that people can have just to think, well, it's not just me, it's someone else. And that's, I guess, what a parent would do. They would say, well, okay, 
to a child who didn't have that information. And I'm not saying clients are children by any stretch of the imagination. However, it is about giving information and giving that stability. And, you know, the, the, the person-to-person relationship is, as you said, the most important part, building that relationship, seeing that person as an individual in their own right, and being curious, being, you know, there and listening and trying to enter the frame of reference. And I guess the one that is an interesting one for me is the transpersonal relationship, this spiritual, and it, and that's what comes up in supervision. A good supervisor would say, how do you feel about this line? And the super and and it's at that point it's very telling about how the relationship is forming and sustaining. So I have a supervisor who says to me, oh, "I really don't like this client." Then we go into an explanation of what's going on, and that might take us back to the transfers, counter transfers. <laughs> so it's a useful model, and it's a it's a model I think you can map to personal development very, very, very easily because it's a it's a good way of sustaining relationships. And I'll let you into a little secret. I try to use this model where I can, not perfect, doesn't always work, but I found it very, very, very helpful. Very helpful in in um, certainly combating my slightly avoidant attachment style. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a good, it's a good structure to be able to, to refer to when, it be, when things become a little uncomfortable or, or difficult in a, in, a, in a relationship camp. Very much so, and 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 I think the key word there is relationship. So this is mm. not just about uh, therapy. Of course, it, that that's what it was developed. But if you're a supervisor, anywhere mm. where you're looking to build a relationship, you know, there's elements of this that 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 come into play. It's definitely worth downloading the handout. Get yeah. yourself over to counselingtutor.com. Click on the podcast tab. Make your way to episode two hundred and forty six. Go and get Rory's super duper handout uh, a patuxka clarkson five relationship model oh i wish i could say it as well as you do rory i definitely <laughs> trip over the names i really do but that's me so uh practice partner now we're, we're moving away from theory in practice into practice partner where we recognize that specifically in today's day and age more and more practitioners are turning to private practice either part-time in private practice or full-time or building a private practice over the years and we like to touch on little elements of this because we know it's important to you and today the topic we're going to look at is paid for advertising Rory you know we spoke about websites we spoke about having traffic to your website you know you can have a website but without people visiting your website or seeing your directory listing or whatever it may be uh, they don't know you really exist uh, and uh, pay, paid advertising is a way to get some eyes on your website or to get some people to take the call to action to get in contact with you. And I've, I've kind of made a short list, Rory, of directory listings, which you can kick us off with. We're then going to go on and compare that up with ethical body listings, and then we're going to go to uh, uh, pay-per-click advertising, which I'll jump into. Do you want to kick us off on those directories? And yes. Body so, private yeah. Directories? Yeah. Yes. So... So, you know, when, we, when we're thinking of anything in our counselling practices, it's about putting yourself in the client's shoes. You know, you, you put, thinking of the client's journey. And the client is distressed, looking, looking to alleviate that distress or talk to somebody. What do they do? Where do they go? And what they will probably do is type in therapy or counselling, into a search engine on the internet. They may ask friends for recommendations, but generally speaking, most people just jump on the internet type counselling. And what comes up in the search engines dictates what people will click on and look at. And one of the, the things that has been incredibly successful over recent years is counselling directories, um, such, such, such as ones operated by ethical bodies or independent organisations, where you can list yourself, usually a picture, um, usually your experience, your location. Do you work online or do you work just face-to-face? -face? Um, do you offer supervision? And you, you would pay to have your uh, profile put on to, um, to a page and people could view you and then they can they can click and send you an email, or you may have a phone number, phone or text, um, and they can get hold of you. And at that point, you can then talk with the clients and, you know, see if you're a good fit 
for them. And I've talked about independent organisations such as uh, directory listings, but also uh, growing now ethical bodies uh, have their own listings. So, you know, a lot of a lot of clients may very well recognise the names of ethical bodies and put in counselling and the name of the ethical body, and that would come up, and that would come up on the top of the search results, and you go in, and you can advertise there. So there's there's lots of different listings, and there's lots of different ways of um, promoting yourself on those listings, Ken. There is indeed, Rory, and, and, and this is all about paid advertising. So mm. um, with my ethical body, I'm a member of my ethical body, and I pay my annual subscription, but that does not give me a place in the in the directory. Oh. To go into the directory, I have to pay a little bit more. Um, and and it, it's about you thinking about, is that worth it for you? I mean, we've we've spoken about the advantages and disadvantages of the the uh, the directory sites before in previous episodes. And just in brief, that the benefits are that it it will probably come up high on the search results, as you've already said, Rory. One of the disadvantages is you might be there with 100, 200, 1,000 other therapists that are also listed there. So, but that is an, a, an area, and of course, I think we, we don't need to speak too much more about that because it's pretty self-explanatory. What I did want to go into is other ways of paying to advertise your services. And one of them that is very popular is Google PPC. And PPC stands for pay per click. So pay per click is an advertising model that suggests that you create an advert uh, and that that you only pay if somebody clicks on the advert and therefore visits your website. So that is when the cost is incurred. And that is why it's called pay per click. So you're really paying to have traffic to your website. So it's user, if we're talking about Google pay per click, some of the the advantage of this is it is a user generated search. In other words, as you said, Rory, thinking of the client's journey, the the prospective client's journey, maybe somebody is struggling with something in their life. Maybe they go uh, online and they put into a search engine, help with depression or something like that. They're putting in a specific word and they are searching and you can have an advert trigger when that word is put in. So that is how it actually works. Now, if you go to Google yourself, and put in a search for counselor near me. And I, I challenge you to go and do this. Go go on Google, put in counselor near me and hit return and have a look at what comes up. And you'll see right at the top, those that are listed right at the top, if you look on the left-hand side in very small writing, you'll see the word AD, meaning ad. So in other words, those top searches, they are adverts that Google puts there and that is their, how they monetize their search platform by pushing people who pay more higher up. And just uh, I was looking at some uh, some research on where the clicks come in, Rory. If you are in position number one when that search is put in, you get 43.32% of the clicks. So 43% of people will click on that top ad. Second one is 3736 the third one down is 29% and the fourth one down is 19%. So you can see how being higher, paying more, because that's the model, and I'll go into that in a moment, how it actually works. Paying more puts you higher up and you therefore should get more traffic from that. It is keyword generated, meaning you get to say, I want it to trigger when somebody puts in counsellor and maybe your area. So if I was in Warrington, I'd say counsellor in Warrington, I want my advert to show. So you would say what the parameters are. They're called keywords that would trigger your ad. So there's the advantage is that you can get seen. The advantage is it's pretty instant. So if you start an ads campaign and you pay your money, uh, you're going to be there straight away pretty much. As soon as, as soon as that's been set up, you'll start showing. So disadvantages of this Google pay-per-click advertising is you're competing against other businesses. That may be other therapists, but it may also be businesses related to counseling and psychotherapy. You, you mentioned, Rory, the directories. Mm. 
Yes. You do have ethical body directories, but there are also some private directories that just specialize in coming high in Google for counselors. And that may be a counseling directory or a, a directory uh, suited towards your niche. Uh, and they may be using Google pay-per-click advertising. In fact, that challenge that I gave you of counseling near me, I can almost bet you, and I don't, I don't do that a lot, Rory. <laughs> you don't. You don't. <laughs> <laughs> that when, that re when it returns its uh, results, you're going to see a directory listed up there with ad next to it. Now, we would imagine that a directory maybe has hundreds, if not thousands of therapists that are paying an annual fee. So they've got a big budget or a bigger budget than maybe an individual practitioner. Therefore, they can maybe pay a little bit more for an advert, which means they can outrank uh, an individual practitioner. So competing with bigness, bi businesses that have bigger budget, uh, such as uh, directories or therapist client pairing apps. There's a big move at the moment for these apps. Uh, I'm not going to mention any names, but there's a few of them out there that will pair a, 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 a therapist and a client together. And they usually target uh, clients and then they target the therapist separately and get them to to it's like a listing, but it's, I guess, a little bit more sophisticated. And they also advertise on Google. Um, and you also are competing against businesses who employ paid media agencies. So when the big businesses have got uh, uh, quite a bit of budget, they usually get specialist agencies to run their pay-per-click adverts for them. Um, and uh, the agencies obviously really know how to optimize uh, those ads. And it can be quite a learning curve for us as individuals going in. Of course, we can go to an agency to, to run our ads for us, but they usually charge us a fee. And it's usually a percentage of spend that you need to put in on that. You can also burn through your budget uh, pretty quickly with these pay-per-click adverts if you're not tracking, if it's not optimized well, and, and it needs really careful tracking to be effective. It is effective. It's very effective if you run it properly. Google does have free uh, training on how to use their PPC adverts. There are many therapists that are getting good business through using pay-per-click adverts. And what I like about it, Rory, is that it is what's called non-disruptive. So disruptive is I'm on Facebook and an advert comes up and wants to pull me away from Facebook to show me something or sell, sell, sell me something. That's disruptive. I was busy just scrolling through Facebook. But if I go on Google and I type in a search and I get a result, that is not invasive. I'm actually asking. So that, I guess, is pay-per-click advertising, Rory. Yeah, and I think I think I'll pick up on the on the difference between invasive and non-invasive advertising because um, I, I'm, I'm sure I'm, I'm not different to many other people who get maybe a little miffed when I'm scrolling through something or even if I'm nowadays, if I'm watching the TV and it's adverts have come on because I'm being sold something I may not want. It's, it's a passive, um, it's a passive thing, isn't it? And I saw an advert the other day for, um, you know, children's rusks. I, I have no need at 64 <laughs> for children's rusks, I can assure you. And, and I understand that... The tea, Rory, they're thinking about dipping it in the tea, I'm sure. Oh, that's, for, that's purely for Garibaldi's. You know, there are rules, Ken. And... Um, and what's really what's really what's really interesting, of course, is it's a scattergun approach. They they advertise to millions of people in the hope that the audience that they're after will be watching it. With um, non disruptive or you know pay per click advertising, yeah. people are searching and it's put in front of you. And um, I, I think you know I think there's something to be said for that in that people will. Say so, well, you know that's that's how a business may operate. A business may advertise themselves, but not kind of pester me. I don't like. I don't know about you, Ken, but I don't like being pestered, as we say <laughs> in the north of England. <laughs> so that 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 is Google PPC, and we're now. I'm going to speak about Facebook because Facebook. It is yes, it is a disruptive advertisement. However, it can be effective as well. So I I, I think it's worth speaking about Facebook. And, and of course, other social media platforms apply here. I'm just using these as examples. And then of course, there are other search engines that also do paid advertising. So Facebook is a bit trickier uh, to use for advertising, specifically for counseling or psychotherapy. And the reason for that is that the way that the Facebook algorithm works is it targets demographics. So it will target a certain age group, a, uh, a gender, 
um, and it will serve it, it, it will target people based on websites that they visit externally to Facebook as well. So there's a lot of tracking involved um, and it can be done, uh, but it is you, you might be better off advertising something like CPD. If you if you offer mm. we've spoken about portfolio careers, if you offer CPD, uh, uh, then targeting on Facebook and saying, I want to target counselors uh, who work with grief, for example, the algorithm's really good for that. And then you might come up on somebody's timeline saying, hey, uh, extended grief CPD workshop or whatever it may be, click here. And then it makes sense because that it's targeting a demographic, but it's difficult to reach a demographic of a, of a client who may be struggling or in a difficult situation, because how is Facebook determining that? And mm. the ethics of it just make me a little bit, you know, I don't know how it works. It all happens behind the magic curtain uh, <laughs> with information that may be stored outside of your jurisdiction and the, the data protection laws that apply to you within your com com uh, country or where you're based. The advantage of using social media advertising example facebook is that it is a very smart algorithm it can target specific behaviors the question then is the ethics and how that is happening you know are they tracking somebody that is in distress that might be looking for help and then putting an advert in front of them is that right that's for you to answer but if uh, managed well the cost per click on facebook can give you what's called a return on investment in other words you can uh, it can be a profitable venture. Um, disadvantages of Facebook. More providers are blocking tracking. So uh, I think Apple with their, their, their Apple phones were the first to, to kind of block the tracking. And more and more we're seeing a blocking of tracking, people understanding that their privacy and their data is a currency that's being bought and sold uh, as a commodity. Uh, and more and more we're becoming savvy and we're not wanting our data to be tracked. And that that is making uh, social media advertising and these algorithms less effective. The CPA or the cost per acquisition, as it is known, can be high. So you could be paying £40 to £100, uh, I'm speaking in UK currency now, for a single client, meaning that you would have to have sales based on the back of that. So the client would need to come for multiple sessions to, to make it break even or to run a profit. So it can be quite expensive just to land um, uh, the, the, the client in the first place. It is complex to manage and track accurately. Again, it's like Google pay, pay per click. You can burn through your budget very, very quickly and see little to no results and wonder why. Um, it, it's, it's not like keywords where you know, I want to show for counseling near me, I want to show for help with depression, I want to help with uh, help with grief, you know, you can target what you're doing with those keywords in something like Google pay per click. With with uh, social media advertising, specifically something like uh, Facebook, you're in the dark of who that is being targeted and how they are being targeted. It's all happening behind the scenes. So you don't have any control over that, which I think is a disadvantage. And I think this this is important. The success of any pay-per-click, so whether you're Google pay-per-click or Facebook, at the end of the day, somebody's on the internet, they're clicking on either your advert or uh, your, your pop-up or whatever comes up and they're going to your website. So if your website does not convert well, so if somebody goes to your website, looks and goes, nah, actually that doesn't feel like it fits for me and they go away, you've paid for that click. You've paid for it. So you want a high converting web page. So you want a web page that when the person gets there, they go, yes, this person feels like a fit for me. And of course, you're not going to convert every single click that comes through to your site. But there are ways of optimizing uh, what you have on the page that they click through to. Uh, and we've spoken about that already in previous episodes where we speak about the messaging that you may put out speaking from the client's frame of reference, not boasting about your qualifications, but but more like uh, recognizing where they may have come in for. So an example of that, if I put in uh, help with depression into Google and 
uh, I cl- an advert comes up that I'm uh, struggling with depression, uh, counseling for depression. I click on that and I come through to a website. I would want that website to, to continue that conversation saying something like, you know, if you're struggling with depression, it can be like this. And I recognize it can be like that and like this. And I've been working with depression for some time. So we would want a continuity mm. uh, in the conversation for that to be um, uh, effective. How it works, you set a daily, weekly or monthly budget on both PPC and uh, social media advertising. Uh, and then uh, you say how much you're willing to pay if you're on Google. Uh, and uh, every time somebody clicks, you are you're paid. You you are paying that, and you almost go into an auction type uh, style where uh, a, a, another practitioner might say, "Well, I'll pay ten cents a click," and somebody else will say, "Well, I'll pay fifty cents a click," and someone else will say, "I'll pay uh, uh, I don't know a dollar a click or whatever it may be," and you're bidding uh, of what your maximum bid are. It can be effective, but it can also be, um, I guess quite confusing. And then finally, I wanted to uh, speak about print advertising in a local publication. And this can be uh, effective. So here I live in North Wales, and we have a little paper that comes out once a month, and it gets delivered through our letterbox. And when I lived in Warrington, we had a little paper that would come through our letterbox once a month, it was free. And within there, you'll have local news, uh, the, 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 the mayor did this or whatever happened in the town that that, that <laughs> month. And uh, they make their money from advertisers, local advertisers. And I often would look in a local paper if I was looking for a plumber or an electrician, someone who is local to come and uh, 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 if I had a job for them. So putting a print advert in a local news circular. So the advantage is, or it goes out locally. Now that is good if you're looking to work face to face in the room. So it's going to be targeted to your geographic location. It's another advantage is it is a fixed cost, Rory. So there's not, it's not like the pay-per-click where you might be burning through money, not knowing how much and where and how to set a cap on it. There's no direct link to your bank account. They, they say it's this much to pay an advert. You give them the money and the money is paid and the advert goes in, which is reassuring in some ways, I guess. If you do block bookings in these local Uh, circulars or or newspapers or magazines, you can get editorial coverage. And and what I mean by editorial coverage, you might say, you know, if I, if I take three months worth of adverts, will you let me write a half page about my service in the area? And you can speak about the people you help and the things that you deal with, and it'll, they they would head it up, they're always looking for for fillers to fill up Mm. uh, interest stories, you know, local counsellor work specializing in blah 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 whatever it may be so uh, it's worth asking if you do do advertising with a local another advantage is it puts your repeating message in front of prospective clients regularly and it may be that they only glance that you're a therapist and that you're in the area and maybe some of the things you work with and that that sits in the subconscious, but then they might be at work and somebody will say, oh, I'm really struggling with X, Y, Z. And they may go, I'm sure I saw this, isn't there a therapist in the blah, Mm. blah, blah directory. So with regular advertising, being in front of people all the time, you can kind of get that uh, playing out there, that repeating message in front of people can be really powerful. Um, And it can also establish you as a local expert or specialist. You know, the fact that you're local, the fact that you're there regularly, the fact that you might have editorials from time to time, that creates something called brand awareness. You know, the big companies spend a lot of money on brand awareness, being seen a lot, being spoken about a lot, and being in the the eyes of the customers a lot. And that can can, uh, establish you in the perception of the readers of that magazine as the local specialist. And I do remember Rory in uh, one of the Warrington uh, papers, we used to advertise a different business in there, but there was a, uh, a hypnotherapist that had a monthly column and he would Mm. 
do a little bit of a motivational thing and and a call to action at the end and he was a regular advertiser in the magazine and had done a deal to do this regular column and I tell you something, I certainly perceived him as the, the expert in my area. <laughs> you know, why go yeah. anywhere else? It was there all the time. Some of the disadvantages of the print ad is it comes at a cost. Um, if you are placing ads with any kind of publication, always ask for a better rate. <laughs> That's the yeah, never play the card rates as they call it. <laughs> the card it. Yeah, when they say, how much is this going to cost me? <laughs> They're going to give you a rate and you say, okay, but you can do better than that. And sometimes going in late will get yep. you a better rate. You know, if they say we publish on a Thursday, uh, if you go in on a Wednesday and say, oh, come on, pop, pop an advert in, if they've still got open space, chances are they may let that go. Uh, here's all the sneaky tricks, Rory. Yeah. <laughs> of course, if you book uh, more, more months, you, you get a better rate as well. The placement of the advert may be poor and get few eyes. So if you look through those local mags, be mindful of where your advert shows up, specifically if you're advertising regularly. You know, if you feel that you're uh, across for some, from something that's very distracting, a big full color, full page, and you're on the left-hand side in a little block there, you might want to ask for a more preferential uh, placement of your advert. And I, I think the final disadvantage I want to call for here, Rory, is that print to web conversions are low. So, if you're on the website, if I'm on Google and I type something in and a website comes up, whether it's an advert or a, a, a uh, organic listing and I click on it and I'm gonna go through there, I'm instantly on that website. I don't have to go anywhere else. I'm on the same medium. But if I'm reading a magazine or I'm reading a local circular and then it asks me to go to HTTP colon forward oh, slash forward yeah. slash www.idocounselingforyou.com forward slash working with depression, it becomes a very difficult call to action. Uh, it really does. So what works well with print is um, uh, uh, having a telephone number, a dedicated phone, uh, we spoke in our last episode, I think, about uh, leaving a message on your phone if you're not able there to uh, pick that up. And there's just some thoughts on paid advertising. Any final thoughts on that? Rory? Yeah, I, I mean, I think there's it's it's it's, it's, it's such a, a kind of mixed economy advertising in general. Anybody who runs a business will know that it's it's a real mixed economy. And I think that it's really important that you. In, in, if you're running your own private practice, think about how much bang you're getting for your book. Yep. So please measure results. So that is absolutely important. You know, have a bit, have a spreadsheet. And when you get an inquiry, just ask, you know, where did you see me? And just, and just mark it on your spreadsheet. At the end of the month, you can see where your money's best spent. And then you can think about, well, you know, I, 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 might be, I may be able to do some more advertising on that medium or maybe mediums like it. So, um, you know, don't spend money on advertising without having some form of measurement. It would be would be my plea. I think I think it's a, I think it's a good indication of any time you spend some money. You need to you need to get a bang for your buck. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it, it becomes more and more that way, Rory, as, as yeah. the, 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 I guess the situation we all find ourselves in is that money goes, goes less far. <laughs> the yes, go, it does. Spent right. It's a serious consideration paid advertising. Are you getting the ROI? That's what Rory speaks yeah. about. It's the return on investment. If I put in a hundred pounds into advertising, how much comes out? And the best way to do that is to track it. As you're saying, when somebody comes in or inquires, with you, uh, ask them, how did you find me? And then kind of mark where that is. Um, so that is today's episode of, of Practice Partner. In our next episode of Practice Partner, we're going to be covering uh, building a referral network. So a free way of generating clients. So make sure you tune in for our next uh, uh, series on that. Uh, but now on to Practice Matters, Rory, where we look at an element of uh, something that make prop up cop crop up. <laughs> <laughs> practice wow uh and today uh you did an interview rory with dr dwight turner working with otherness and i believe there's also a uh, a, a lecture in the counselor cpd library and in our counseling study resource on this because it is such a broad topic 
It's true, Ken. And equality and diversity is is now becoming more and more talked about in the world of counselling and psychotherapy, as it is in society in general, and that only has to be a good thing. However, sometimes we forget that we are all diverse in our own ways, and otherness is about realising that when we're working with people, they are different to us. They, they, are, they have a different phenomenological view of the world. And I caught up with Dr. Dwight Turner, who is who is becoming and is, is forming a um, a solid following in terms of equality and diversity and working with others. He's done a lecture on working with others. As Ken said, it's in the uh, Counselor Study Resource Library for Students and the CPD Library for Qualified Practitioners. And this is what he had to say. And we welcome Dr. Dwight Turner. Turner, who's produced a fantastic lecture for the Councillor CPD Library on the subject of exploring the intersections of privilege and otherness. So, Dr. Dwight Turner, thank you so much for joining us again. It's my absolute pleasure to be here. Thanks for bringing me back. So, it, it, it is a pleasure. This, as I say, it's the second time we've we've interviewed we've interviewed you and we've met. Um, so I, I think it might be uh, interesting to kind of talk about um, intersections. What mm-hmm. are intersections? Well, basically, it's, it's it's a simplified way of trying to explain something which is quite not necessarily complex, but something which is quite broad that we haven't really thought about. And actually, what it means in this context is that we are not just one identity. Um, I'm not just a man of colour, for example. I'm, I'm a man of colour, I'm heterosexual, I'm from a working class background, I'm the son of immigrants, and we all walk with different types of identity at any one moment in time, some that come and go over periods of time, some which we're, we're born with and we may divest ourselves of, of later on in life. The problem with the intersections part is, as they cross over, and as they give us certain levels of privilege and otherness, what may happen is, that we might feel like we're an outsider or we, we have certain benefits that we don't deserve or we feel like we're, like we're an outsider and we don't want to be an outsider. And these intersections are ways of showing that we, they cross over, that we interact with, 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 with our own sort of privilege and others, others all the time. Um, so that's basically what intersections is. It comes from an old, uh, not an old phrase at all really, but it comes from the work of Kimberly Crenshaw and her ideas around intersectional theory, um, uh, as well as you know, Christian Hills Collins and Audre Lorde, that sort of third wave of feminists, uh, speaking from the black community of the States, who looked at actually the fact that women, for example, were not just disadvantaged as women, um, but could also be disadvantaged as, as women of color, and how those two intersections then cross over to create a whole new need for understanding the sort of legal frameworks of the United States. And it's similar, similar to over here. So that's basically what it sort of talks to. Yes, and I, I guess that that leads on to this idea of otherness, that when we meet someone in the therapy room, mm-hmm. that that we might not be aware of that um, intersection that they have. We When we meet mm-hmm. someone, we're meeting mm-hmm. another. And I think the interesting thing about otherness is that it, it, a lot of people may may take the view it's about maybe sexuality or skin colour, mm-hmm. but otherness is a mm-hmm. wide panoply of mm-hmm. difference, isn't it? Totally agree. Yeah, it's, it's a wide panoply of difference. I, I, like, I love that phrase because it is. We all walk with a sense of otherness. We've all experienced being marginalised as an outsider. I think because we're, we're so conditioned to look at, especially in the United Kingdom, the nine protected characteristics of the, of the Equalities Act 2010, which is relevant and is it important, what we don't tend to explore is actually some of us sit with other forms of otherness which might sit outside of those nine characteristics. The easiest, the easiest example, if you like, is children form different groups, in groups and out groups, from a very early age. It's their way of trying to understand who they are, and I've talked about on, on some of the slides. Um, now, children don't marginalise based around the protective characteristics. What they do is actually work out who they are and who they are not and keep going through that process over and over again. And we also do it as adults. So when we, when we encounter the other in the therapy room, you're quite right. We may not know what their experience of being, a, of marginalized, uh, what their experience of being marginalised might be, but it will be there. It's a part of their um, intersectional identity, a holistic, holistic view of who they are. 
Yeah, and I, yeah. I think you make a really, really interesting point. I think sometimes when we look at the Equalities Act, and I'm speaking about legislation that's in yeah, the United yeah. Kingdom here for, for international listeners, um, mm. it, it, it sets out nine um, protected characteristics. And I think it's easy just to see someone... Um, in the very narrow band yeah. of that characteristic and not realise that they may fit into another characteristic and also define them just in one dimension. Mm, I totally agree. And that can even go, because there are even characteristics within characteristics. You know, neurodiversity, for example, is a massive area. Um, disability is, is a massive, massive area in, in itself. And it, there are visible and invisible disabilities. So why, you know, what, the fact we, we try and remain within these structures it's easy or easier, but us as therapists which, and counsellors and so on and psychologists and psychiatrists, which have to work with, with a lot more complexity. And what intersectional theory, theory actually does, it offers a, a language and a way of understanding the complex nature of human, na- of, of human beings. We're not just one or two characteristics or identities. We're way more complex than that. Yes, and and I, 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 having looked at the slides of the of the presentation, one of the things that really struck with me is that you you quote the I thou I it idea from <laughs> from Martin yeah. Buber, who was a very f- famous philosopher <clears throat> and one to whom lots of therapists drew inspiration from. Just say a little bit about the I this and the I thou, because I think it's so significant when working mm-hmm. with otherness. I yeah, totally agree. And it's played a lot of a big role in my sort of doctoral research many years ago now. Um, one of the things to say to start off with, though, really, is one has to remember that, that um, Martin, Martin Buber's work came out of his own experience of being other during the Second World War. Um, and very much informed his ideas. And what he actually came up with was... was he made it fairly simple, and it's not as simple as, as, as this in, in some ways. The I-it relationship, which he talks about, involves actually the I, oneself, the subject, who under that sort of route, basically using the other for their own needs. So it can't. It, 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 there's no. It's not an. Inter, it's not a, a in, in personal relationship. It's one based upon one's own sort of requirements. Where we might see this in the modern day and age, objectification. The, the need of a man to therefore see the, the, the woman as an other, to play, the, play a, a role based upon what they might want, not what, what they might need, that makes sense. That's very different to an I thou relationship, where there's more of a relationship, interpersonal. It's, it's more about, okay, where are we going together on this journey to co- co-create something? And that's a very different space. And often as therapists in the therapeutic space, what we can do is we can, build up, we can reside behind theories and ideas about how we view the other person, pathologizing, you know, we might pathologize perhaps, but we don't mean to. That can be very much an I it relationship as opposed to perhaps a more person-centered or humanistic way of exploring the relationship whereby I'm going with a sense of curiosity about who the other person is, whilst also realizing that I'm going to be changed by that experience. That makes sense. It changes the power dynamic based within that sort of environment. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, I think in any therapy, and indeed, I think in any relationship, finding yeah. out who the other is and and their uniqueness and and their experience of what makes them them is mm. the is the foundation of a relationship relationship mm. building. And and I'm interested in the fact that you 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 kind of blend Buber's work with Jung, who of course is <laughs> is well known for for subconscious process or unconscious process yeah, yeah and and what is the direction of bringing young in we've, we've talked about Boober who's yeah. a conscious you consciously othering somebody for your own uh, needs and gratification and there's no better mm, mm, there's no better mm. example of that than being jewish in germany during the second world war mm, yeah but the unconscious process what's happening there well, it's, it's, it's a very good question in a, in a way. Remember, Buber and Jung didn't really get along that well in, 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 in their own interpersonal relationship. You know, Buber felt that Jung spent too much time in the unconscious. But one of the things that Jungian psychology has given us is the idea, a couple of things in, in a way, that in that um, space of an I-it relationship, where we actually deny, we reduce the other person down to a few core components, we other them or stereotype or objectify them in some way. Their 
identity doesn't go, it doesn't just fall off the planet, it doesn't disappear. It gets pushed into the unconscious from whereby it will bubble away and maybe come back to the surface in some other form, some other way, shape or form at some point. Now, where Jungian psychology takes us a stage further, if you like, is in recognizing, and in a great book that was written by Marie-Louise von Franz called Projection and Recollection, where she talks a bit about how whole groups can other, other groups, if you like, um, objectify, stereotype, whatever it might be, and therefore place their shadow material onto that other group. So they can't quite be authentically themselves. What they end up becoming is what we need them to be in order for us to, start to, to, to feel some sort of semblance of perfection. That sort of narcissistic need to actually be seen as the good person. That might make, make sense. Um, and I think what Marie, Marie Louise von France also says is for a culture to, to grow, a bit like the individual, for them to grow, that I it has to become more of an I thou. And in order for that to happen, the shadow other has to return home to its source, to us, ultimately. Yes, and, and for those of you who may not be familiar with Jungian psychoanalytical theory, the, the idea, if I'm correct, and I'm, I'm not a scholar of Jung by any stretch of the imagination, mm-hmm. is the shadow self is that is that kind of um, difficult part of our personality, mm-hmm. the personality that we, 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 we perhaps don't like to... Um, admit we have and i know when i've done some training i i used to ask uh, students you know what what makes you what irritates you about others yeah. and they would list a whole load of things and i'd say is that possible that that's actually what irritates you about yourself <laughs> mm-hmm. oh, you're quite right yeah that's the shadow is the other yeah was one of the phrases that that young came up with the shadow, and that's yeah you're right if we're irritated by it our egoic sense of self or identity is challenged by the mere presence of the other in a way Yes. Yes. So as we as we come to the end of this of this interview, what do you hope that people will take away from this lecture? What do you hope that people may be able to take away personally and instill into their practices? Well, I personally hope that that people take away that there is a language here that we can all use as practitioners to understand one, our own sense of otherness, because that's where this all starts. There is this privilege. There's no shame attached to it. It's just part of who we are. But also how that might present itself in a therapeutic space, through dreams, through creative work, being able to actually work with the other and not be afraid to have difficult conversations about the social constructions of identity that will come into our spaces. We're therapists and counsellors. We're professionals. So we, we, often, we often talk about some very difficult things. This, otherness, diversity, is a part of that whole process. So that's what we can actually, this is what I hope that people will be able to take away from the presentation. And on a personal level, it really is just about bringing people together. The more that we see the other, the more likelihood there is that actually we were able to interact and co-create a better environment for the work that we do together and the way we live as human beings. If we're not seeing the other, if we're not willing to see the other, then actually we're not to, we're not we're not a community at all. Well, exploring the intersections of privilege and otherness is in the CPD library and available for you to watch. And as always, Dr. Dwight Turner, thank you so much for joining us. Big thank you to Dr. Dwight Turner. Big thank you to you, Rory, for for hosting that interview. And of course, if you would like to see the entire lecture of Dr. Dwight Turner, you can get that if you're a qualified practitioner by logging into the Counselor CPD Library. If you're still a student, we've made it available for you as well. And you can get that in the Counselor Study Resource. If you're not a member of the CPD Library or the Counselor uh, CPD uh, or counsellor study resource, make your way to counsellingtutor.com. All the information is right there on the home page. And this has been episode 246 of the Counselling Tutor podcast. Yeah, so we started off with theory and practice, talking about Petruska Clarkson's five relationship model it speaks to transpersonal and intersubjective relationships. We moved on to practice partner, where we explored and examined uh, how we advertise and the different mediums we can advertise in. And finally, in practice matters, I interviewed Dr. Dwight Turner and his lecture, Working with Otherness. And as always, stay grounded and stay safe.